Welcome one and all. It's an honor for me to launch the 2020 School of Art Postgraduate Show. I'm Martin Evans. I'm Director of Manchester School of Art, and it gives me pleasure to congratulate our students on the creativity and resilience that has led to such an engaging body of work. Collectively, you have made this show possible, and I'm proud of you and all of the staff in the school. Obviously, we recognize this year has been unprecedented, and the current context is one that when you started your studies, you would never have imagined what 2020 has brought you. I'm not going to dwell on the multitude of challenges you have faced. Rather, I'm here to recognize the tenacity and imagination that you have shown to ensure that you can be proud of the work you have all produced. You've reached a point now in your professional and creative development that I too have experienced. I'm a graduate of Manchester School of Art and I completed my Masters in Industrial Design in 1997. They were good, if very different times though. The opportunity to launch this show has made me reflect on my time in the school as a student and something that has helped me immensely on my personal journey. So in 1997, the theme of our Masters show was Glory Glory MA, with an obvious nod to the city's sporting heritage. The theme of your show, Materialize, recognizes the culmination and manifestation of all of the efforts and is a point in your development that I hope you two will look fondly back upon. You face many challenges and you've met them with the creativity that I would expect from graduates from Manchester School of Art. So from a member of the class of 1997, I wish the class of 2020 all the very, very best. I know that while there is uncertainty ahead, your future is bright, so do make the most of all the opportunities that present themselves. I'll now hand over to Katie and the panel of alumni, and I look forward to engaging with you all as you go on out into the world on your creative journey. Enjoy your show. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this launch event for Manchester School of Art postgraduate end of year degree show. My name is Katie Popwell. I'm a radio broadcaster and a creative producer. And like Martin, I also did my MA at MMU many years back. So congratulations to all of you that have completed your masters. It's such a brilliant feeling and I hope you're celebrating in any way that you can. I can promise you that even though it feels like an ending of sorts and a strange one under the circumstances, I can promise you it's very much the beginning. A virtual version of the MA show is available to view online and the physical show is now postponed until 2021. But having said that, today is about you. It's about celebrating your achievements and exploring what the future holds for you. Having spoken to many of you about what you wanted to get out of today's event, we're hosting a panel discussion with three Manchester School of Art alumni from across the departments. They're going to talk about some of the challenges that they faced as new graduates getting established in the creative sector and of course more broadly what the future holds for the sector in light of the current crisis. So let me introduce our panel to you. Bucky Baldwin is a multidisciplinary artist and social practitioner specialising in print, illustration and embroidery. She graduated in textile design and went on to found Bucky Baldwin Limited an ethical, handmade, sustainable clothing label that provides employment opportunities for marginalised people and aims to use creative practice as a tool to bring out positive change. Lauren Dunn is an award-winning film producer who's worked across independent film, BBC drama and major music promos. She's had her work screened at Sundance and Palm Springs Film Festival. She's won tons of accolades, too many to list here really, but highlights include being named 2017 Screen Daily Star of Tomorrow, British Screen Forum Future Leader, and winning the BFI's Vision Award and Best Producer Award at the BAFTA accredited Underwire Film Festival. She also teaches at Manchester School of Art and acts as a mentor for BBC New Creatives. And finally, Omid Asadi is an artist working across a wide range of creative disciplines. A former engineer and champion boxer from Iran, his work investigates complex issues around identity and explores his own experiences of immigration and the social and political conflict that he experienced growing up. Since he graduated in 2018, he's gained recognition for his intricate leaf cuttings and now his work appears in public and private collections worldwide and is widely featured across global media. 
His multimedia solo exhibition, Autopsy of a Home, at Manchester's Centre for Contemporary Chinese Art, draws on the ideas of Michel Foucault to explore the experience of the migrant diaspora. And it will be reopening when the venue is able to accept visitors again. So welcome to our panel. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have a conversation between the four of us and then we're going to open this up to some questions from students. So I think it's really important, given the context, that we're as honest and as practical as we can be in today's discussion. Our graduates are moving into a world where stable employment opportunities within the creative economy are scarce. The sector is largely made up of freelancers who, as we know, haven't been getting a great ride lately. So first off, I want you to tell me in turn, what was your first job or paid gig after graduating? How did you get it and how did it lead to your second one? So Lauren, can we start with you? Um, yeah, sure. So it's interesting also because I, I graduated in 2010, which was a bit of a weird time as well for the film industry because it was as they uh, dismantled the UK Film Council. So there was, a, there was a hiatus of funding. So it was really hard for new entrants to find work um, in a way that it's much better now. And there's loads of really brilliant support um, from like the BFI Film Fund to help short filmmakers who are, who are new into the industry. Um, my, my first job was actually, it, it came off the back of a visiting lecturer we had at the School of Art, um, and he was a producer, and he gave me a job on a, on a short film that he had, um, and that went on to, to be uh, a job that turned into working on a feature with him. And, and from there, I think it's just you make loads of connections uh, and you meet loads of people who open up lots of other possibilities and, and, and pathways. So that, that was kind of my, my first job. And I met lots of people who I still work with and, and know today, really. You've mentioned funding there and connecting with networks, which are things that we're going to come back to see later on. That's your dog, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's all right. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, they're, they're both things that we're going to come back to later. Bucky, coming on to you, can you tell us about your first job? Yeah, um, my first job after graduating was kind of uh, unrelated to my course. Um, I, well, it was stuff I did whilst on my course. So I did a lot of volunteering in my spare time as a student. Um, and after I graduated, I decided I wanted to spend a year um, volunteering in the community. So um, I did a kind of internship with um, a local church and that was doing loads of stuff like working with um, elderly people's homes, trying to do initiatives to get, you know, fight loneliness in the homes, working with refugee groups, working with homeless charities. And at the time I had, I thought that I could either be a textile designer or a community worker and I was like, well, I'm going to have to give up textiles. But um, actually, weirdly enough, when this year internship ended and I decided that I wanted to create a business to help these groups of people, um, I got my first residency based on the fact that I had a lot of experience working within the community um, with the Whitworth um, Gallery. So I didn't expect it to connect me back into a creative practice, but it actually ended up um, being something that helped set me above um, the other people applying in terms of my experience in community work so yeah that was what I did. So volunteering during your time at university was a really important part of creating those networks. Yes definitely yeah. yeah. Omid how about you what happened when you graduated? After I graduated uh, I invited for exhibition at Castlefield Gallery mm -hmm. and it was a paid uh, actually a paid exhibition and maybe three or four after my graduation and after I did at Castlefield, I invited to be a part of pub, uh, per, per, Performa Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And uh, that was the second one uh, straight away af after I graduated. That's pretty extraordinary. I think for a lot of the fine art MA graduates listening to that, they're going to think that's quite the leap. How was that experience for you in your oh, first that, year? That was amazing. Yeah, I didn't expect that. So that's that's much quick. I be I be there <laughs> because I remember in the beginning of our MA show. Oh, sorry, M M MA course. Uh, we decided with some of the students, and we said. This summer is gonna be a Venice Biennale. 
let's have a plan and go to see the Ven Venice Biennale. I didn't accept I will be in the Venice Biennale on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great for me. Yeah. Can I ask you how you got that first show at Castlefield Gallery? Actually, it wasn't the first show. Uh, I worked with Castlefield uh, Gallery when I graduated from my BA. Mm -hmm. And they saw my sh my works at the, at the um, final show. And yeah, after that, I participated with them two, th three times, actually. Yeah. And one of them was, yeah, one month. I, I don't remember. But I'm sure it, it was after my graduate, my my, my um, when I when I finished my MA, I, I start working with them again. Yeah, I think all three of your answers just show how important developing those relationships and those um, informal networks are just to start with. I mean, um, one of the things that happens when you graduate is that you leave behind that security of a ready-made creative community. You have to go out and you have to start making those relationships yourself. Um, Lauren, you uh, mentioned touched on this a bit before start so so just coming back to you how important first of all were those relationships that you made at university and secondly how did you find your creative community after graduating this is like a really good question actually because it is massively important and and it can feel really daunting and, and something we see you know a lot like teaching on the ba course is that people graduate and dissipate and then it feels really hard to figure out who your people are and, and how to kind of maintain a community um Something I did when I left it is partly because there was this high in funding and all of us wanted to keep making short films that we'd spent, you know, all this time um, doing together. And there, was, there wasn't really a way for us to do that uh, with, with support and backing. So we decided we, we made a collective, basically. And there was a few of us from across different specialisms, animators um, and different types of filmmakers who were... All, all working together under under an umbrella of an, a, collect, a collective name, uh, which helped us. I think again, there's there's there are so many graduates out there, and it's kind of hard to distinguish yourself amongst the crowd. So it was a way for us to kind of use an umbrella to to celebrate everyone who's doing really fantastic stuff, and for us all to benefit off each other's work. Um, and those are people that I I still work with now. You know, like ten ten years on, um, those people who've all to be very successful so that was a really good way for us to kind of maintain our community and have a sense of purpose and direction and and keep that kind of that energy that you have uh, while you're at university um was there another part to that question um I've just no that was kind of what else really, you need to ask. okay i mean i'm i think because you're a mentor and a teacher as well so i imagine you have a kind of broader understanding of those networks that aren't just related to your own personal practice um, do you do you know of kind of what what support networks do you find are really helpful for people coming out of university? Are there any that you can kind of anywhere that you can direct people to that are film graduates? Yeah, sure. And I think as well the other the other important thing is to mention about the kind of the north south divide. The film industry is based in London, and that people feel an overwhelming pressure to move to London. Uh, which I never did and hasn't hindered my career at all. And there are loads of really fantastic networks up here. And I think, you know, the more of us that stay and establish really successful businesses and careers, the better, because the, there is really amazing talent here. And I think it's important for us to kind of stay and support each other. And there's loads of advantages for staying in the North as well. But I'm sure we can talk about that later. In terms of communities, I think that, you know, home cinema is number one place to go. It's where, you know, you go to the bar, you're going but they have a, a film night called Filmed Up, which you can submit work to. And it's like screenings of short films and there's Q and A's and hangouts and normal times where they've been doing stuff digitally as well. Uh, and the BFI Film Hub North is a, is a really great place to check out. They have, they've done tons of events during COVID, loads of online uh, panel sessions with, they've had like Netflix, and casting directors and loads of people sharing expertise and an opportunity to chat with other people. So I say those are the two kind of key places to go to, to build a network. That's great, thank you. Um, Bucky, you graduated uh, with a BA in textiles and practice and you're applying for the MA now, is that right? Yeah. So um, 
what are you hoping to get out of the MA? Well, um, because in my business, what it is, is we're using design and the production process of products um, as a way to bring on board people who struggle with normal routes of employment and train them and things like that. Um, all the stuff I've learned from, it's been from my experience in the different roles I am doing. So um, at the moment, what I'm trying to do is really build some firm research backed um, information on how you can like tangibly help these groups of people. Um, and I want to create a kind of framework um, for people like me who work in community arts to not only provide workshops that, you know, are good for people holistically as they are, but with tools and skills help them better themselves. More like very practically speaking because I think a lot of graduates particularly who specialize in um in social practice find it really difficult to make a living doing you know yeah. workshops working in the gig economy that kind of thing have you had to have a job to support your practice and yourself throughout or have you been able to support yourself through delivering workshops and doing um partnerships with galleries and museums because I know you have a good relationship with Whitworth don't you yes um well I've been lucky enough to since going freelance I've been doing um like related creative jobs um I think that it is it is very difficult um and it's there was a like doing that and launching the business it was a hard time in terms of having just enough funds to like pay rent in some sense um but it is possible especially i think being in manchester and doing community arts i feel like it's one of the best places that um invest in community arts so i find there's a lot more um products going on with charities organizations galleries really wanting to put on workshops or programs for the community so i think i've been lucky enough to be I generally thought London was the only place for arts until I found out this whole new realm of genre, I don't know, um, area of arts, which is, is community arts. But um, yeah, Manchester is really good for it. And once you get into the links, it's a very, um, that people know each other all around. So, and are there, yeah. are there formal networks that people can get involved in or does it tend to be fairly informal? Um, yeah, it's quite informal, um, but it's it's not hard to find. So mm -hmm. if you, a good way to um, get involved with these um, communities is through galleries. So a lot of them for young artists or stuff like that, they have different community groups where um, that those groups collaborate with the gallery for the community. And that's a good place to start and meet people because you are then there in a position to pitch ideas that um, could turn into employment if they want to take on your project or community project. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think pretty much from the start, every job I've done has led to another one in some way. And it's been like rolled on. Um, so it's hard to start. But if, once you get the first one, um, and I think it's also probably worth saying um, to our new graduates that there's a real trend for um, in sort of artistic practice which does have social value and measurable social impact in, in the art world at the moment. And there are a lot of kind of funded opportunities attached to institutions if you do have social practice embedded in your work, probably more than there were maybe five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, coming back to you, Omid. The art world, I mean, you talked about how um, particularly Castlefield Gallery, which is a brilliant institution, supported your work um, while you were studying and after you graduated. Um, but the art world can be a really intimidating one to navigate and understanding how best to engage with those networks of public and private galleries art fairs and collectors can be really daunting for people. Can you offer any advice to new graduates about how to make those connections or at least start to make them? Yeah, one of the 
easiest way. For example, Castlefield Gallery has got something called associate uh, artist. You can be just paying five pounds per month. You can be one of, one of their associate and then you can join their creeds. They have different uh, program during the year and you can join join this uh, pro, uh, pro program and also it's very important you be in most of the opening exhibitions to make a connection with other artists other art organization other galleries and this kind of mm, being active in that kind of field so it's help you to people recognize you and uh, ask you about your work and you ask them about their work how how the how you can work with them this is kind of as you said the the network is very important especially in arts section mm. and uh, one of them is is just being there just attending to the things <laughs> Of course, there's a real challenge with that at the moment, though, yeah, because you can't you know. be there and we can't be together. So how are you sort of navigating that at the moment? How are things in your industry? Have, have things ground to a halt or are people kind of finding new ways to network virtually? Yeah, one, one of the reasons, for example, what, we, what we're doing now is one of the alternative things we can do. So... At the moment, it's it's a good time to, and especially after you graduate, it's a good time now because everything is closed uh, to prepare something to show the galleries. For example, make a very good portfolio, or write a good statement, or make a good CV. That kind of things you can you have a plenty of time to working on on these things, and when the hopefully this pandemic finish then you start being involved and uh, even before that you, you, you can when, when you have got this th these three things for example portfolio a statement and the cv you can send it to the other galleries would you look at majority of them reject you even don't and re re don't reply to you but this is the one of the way you can you can try and so you, all, do you have to develop a thick skin yes to deal exactly. with a lot of rejection yeah exactly yeah this is the you have to being being an artist is not an easy way for for not for living not for uh, progressing you have to have uh, yeah thicker skin and take many things many rejection many hard hardship but if you enjoy from art, you will accept all of these things and you just carry on. I remember one of the, I'm sure those who graduate from MA show, MA, MA, MA course in fine art. I remember one interesting things I, I learned from our MA. There, there is a course near the end of the course, uh, near end of the course, it's called um, professional practice. Mm -hmm. And Ian Lorenson, our tutor, said something very interestingly. And he said, I met a good artist and I asked him, and do, do you have any advice for, for, for my students to give them? And he said, you shouldn't have any plan B if you want to be an artist, because it is too hard and easily after a few months you change your plan to plan B. You, I haven't got any plan. I don't know what's going, what gonna, gonna be happen if something change, if this pandemic continue. I don't know. I just stick to my plan and I, I don't make any other plan. And this is one of the reason I still, I'm, I'm still an artist and after those hardship I, I experience. I have heard that from a lot of people before and I think that is something having that dogged determinism and a singularity of vision is something that is really really important to making a success of yourself in life and making a success of an <laughs> artistic career because it is so hard. Yeah. I think that's a really good piece of advice. Um, Lauren can I come back to you? 
Yours is an industry that very much relies on collaboration. So how has this been for you over the last nine months? What what do you what have you found the main challenges of the pandemic have been in terms of your industry? Yeah, I mean, it is such a collaborative field. Like we, you know, we rely on working together and it, it was very hard at the beginning. You, you know, we had a, a shoot that got, got shut down. We were filming in Ardman. We're still waiting to go back actually shooting an animation. Um, I have friends who were shooting their first features and, you know, it's years of work that goes into that who had to shut down in the, in the middle of their productions. It was it was a lot. It was really like upsetting um, and hard and hard to be apart from everyone. You know, film festivals, um, like I was talking about gallery openings, they're the place where everybody comes together. It's a big community and, and all of those went online. So you're you're not mixing with people in the same way. So it's been it has been challenging. Um, but I think, you know, as a filmmaker you you have to be resilient and um i think there have been opportunities online to, to connect with each other and and you know we've we've done that um but also i think this is also a, a, a really exciting time also um this is this is a huge opportunity for for many many years there have been very rigid um um, a set way of doing things that you know was inconceivable for those things to change and and now we're at a, a point where all of that is up for grabs all of that is up for discussion and I think it is an extremely exciting time to be a, a graduate now, now although it feels really hard and daunting and there, there is less work and there is less sense of community and all of that stuff you know like now is the time to be driving the change to be like telling us what the industry should be and what it could be it, there's never been this opportunity before and I think that's very exciting and I think actually you have a huge amount of power as a, as a, as a new creative in this industry to kind of mix things up you have very little to lose you can kind of go out there and make some noise and really establish like who you are and to be what you have to say and people will really respond to that so I think there is a lot to be said for that opportunity as well and creating new communities around around that too. Yeah because I mean the politics of the film industry have come under massive scrutiny in recent years with the Me Too movement and with BLM it almost seems to be a bit of a crucible in which these kind of uh, issues are played out in a lot of ways. Have, has that, have you felt that very keenly as an independent practitioner working in the North or are those things that you think sort of things that happen in Hollywood, how do they end up relating to, to your practice? Yeah, it's, I, I think like much of the art world, I, I can imagine that there is an issue of class and of race and of privilege, ultimately. Um, I made my first feature last year and I learned a lot doing that. And I, and I realized that um, it's very, it is, well, first of all, we already know it's very hard to, to, to sustain like a business, you know, like I run an independent business, it's very hard. I, I don't do commercial projects. I just do like artist driven work. That's very, very hard to create a sustainable business. Um, and talking with other producers, I wanted to know like, how are people doing this? And I was asking everyone, like, how are you, how are you sustaining your business? And in asking those questions, you find out there is a huge amount of independent wealth in the industry, a huge amount yeah. of privilege. So a couple of us came together. Um, this is about two years ago now. And we set up an organisation called the UK Producers Roundtable. We launched a nationwide survey, surveying every independent film producer in the country and asking questions about accessibility and sustainability. Um, and off the back of that, we found lots of stuff that wasn't surprising, but is deeply worrying that showed that there is an extreme lack of diversity. There is an extreme class problem and extreme privilege problem. And, and we and it's the same people getting the jobs and ending up in high positions of power because they are the people who can afford to and have the connections to and all of that stuff, which is just not how it should be. Um, so we campaigned for, for a number of years to do something about this off the back of these results. And uh, and this year it was out in Variety and Deadline Hollywood and all the kind of trade presses. We published a, a set of best practice guidelines for the UK film industry, which we got all the kind of key players to sign up to the BBC, Film 4, BFI and lots of um, independent agents and uh, sales agents and stuff like that as well, which was securing uh 
basically rights and financial rights for independent film producers to make sure they get the money they deserve to to make in when they're making a project and can continue to run their businesses. And I think with that, we will start to see the, the kind of possibility opening up for, for more diverse voices to come through. And is that the idea that that will that is a resource that emerging filmmakers can can use in order to support the structures and uh, that they need yeah. in order to make new work and find work? What where will they find it? Um, so you can go to the website, which is the ukproducersroundtable.com. dot um, They they like I say there there is a set of guidelines up there which now are industry standards. So they will tell you how much you can ask for for your fee. Mm-hmm. They will tell you like what you know, big financiers aren't allowed to bully you into. They protect all of your rights, basically. That, that, that's never been written down before. Um, so it's, it's a resource and it requires all of us as practitioners in the industry to, to you know, hold that up in those meetings and, and not be, you know, beaten down into, you know, giving up our fee, which is something that happens time and time again, um, particularly for film producers who feel like, if I really want to get this project made, I'm just going to put my money back in. Yeah. Um, I think that's something people have in all no no matter what your creative practice is there's always a sense in which people feel like oh well I'm so lucky to be doing this and so it doesn't really matter if I don't get paid properly and then people kind of paint themselves into a corner and 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 asking for what what they're worth and I think that's something that all graduating students need to be aware of it's definitely something because that can be really be exploited as well. It can be exploited you know. hugely. And, you know, cultural capital is real, people, and you have it. So don't undersell it. Yeah. Um, Bucky, coming to you, you've, you know, your, your practice is really diverse in terms of the fact that as a creative practitioner, you're a textile artist. Um, but obviously, kind of the, the uh, social value work that you do also has a, a huge creative aspect to it. And, and also you run your own business. And so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how all those different parts of what you do intersect with each other and actually how you decided to incorporate what you do as a limited business um, and and, and how that works for you, if that's not too broad a question. Uh, I'll try. (laughs) Um, Basically, um, what um, Ahmed was saying was like spot on that just single mindedness no plan b or they're like if i don't get a job then i'm broke i don't know what i'm gonna do so um that's what has led to there being so many parts to my practices um mm. really throw myself at loads of different projects and um like if there's something i can't do learning it which is why there's like in the business i'm a text artist and then i do painting and then went into fashion and things like that um but how how it all fits together is basically to I didn't have funding for my business until um a good way through or close to launching so I needed to have a practice or I needed to have work but I also needed to learn skills to be in a position where I can say I can run a business and provide a service for people and have like charities trust me to partner with them and mm. provide a service to people who are there helping. So all the jobs I had to take not only had to be my livelihood, but also needed to develop my skill level. So I ended up um, using my textile skills to, in a more illustration way. Um, I'm working with charities, um, doing art projects with them, working with galleries, doing art projects with them. Um, and all the time it helped me become a better designer and a better workshop practitioner which fed into my business where I do both where I design the products and work um, in the community. And how has the pandemic affected you then? Has limitation of resources been an issue if you had to adapt the way that you work? Yes the pandemic so before the pandemic hit I wasn't selling online because um the products we were making were literally um very small scale it was based on the training I was doing for the group at the time so if I was training them in embroidery we would make a small amount of embroidered goods to sell or if it was ceramics a small amount so there wasn't really and we weren't scaled for online and it was just me doing everything so I had to completely close up shop in um the pandemic because the gallery closed 
Um, so I had to literally rethink everything. Um, so going from having a shop space and no online, I'm now um, online with no shop space. Mm. Um, and it's actually just learning like how to um, find customers online and doing all this yeah. stuff. Um, and now I'm having to get staff together because the scale of selling online is so much bigger um, than <laughs> in the shop. And have you found that your audience has grown as a result of this move to online? Has it actually meant a growth of your business? Yes. Um, it's been, yeah, it's as having staff costs increase, but there's been so much more awareness, more customer base, people, more people, more people wanting to like get involved and seeing it not just as a community project, but as a brand that they want to like wear. Yeah from and things like that um yeah so it's it's been a lot of learning but it's it's allowed us to develop to uh, a level that we weren't go aiming for in the near future really yeah so it's I mean like with so many people it's it's a forced change isn't it but in a lot of ways I think it has opened up new ways of working for yeah people. Ahmed, how has uh, how have you adapted the way that you've worked during the pandemic? What's changed? Did you have? I mean, obviously, you had your exhibition at um, the Centre for Contemporary Chinese Art, which had to close. So, so how have you dealt with all that? Yeah, before before pandemic, I have two two show and also three uh, commission, and mm. all of them cancel or postponed. For example. Uh, this this exhibition is now closed. It was one of them, and uh, but this is the way I I can I cannot change this one, but I can change the way I practice. For example, during last few months, when when the pandemic started, I I said, what can I do? I I had not, no access to a studio, so I stay at home. I choose two things. One. I had a big project on reading, so I start reading again and reading new things, especially philosophy and uh, philosophy and art. And also for my practice part, I I covered my or uh, kitchen every time I want to work, and I start uh, painting in a small scales. And uh, this is another way. And we have to be flexible with the problem we faced otherwise we have to give up or wait you know but i can't wait i if i'm not produce uh, my brain you know <laughs> just punch me yeah <laughs> do something and uh, this is the yeah it's affect everyone around the world and and especially us which is uh, showing the work for example now graduate students exactly feel feeling that that situation because they practice for one one year and they want to people coming and see what they what they've done during the one, the one year and now it's closed and but it is not end of the world I'm, I'm sure it's going but but it is gonna gonna be happen maybe hopefully hopefully not but it's gonna be maybe happen in next few years or next few months what do you want to do if something happened again yeah you know i mean there's a sense in which kind of creative people should be the most well equipped to deal with change because responding to your environment and and kind of working through that is an important part of 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 being a creative person are, are there innovations that you're seeing individual artists or museums and galleries or people that you're seeing that are responding to this pandemic in a way that you're finding inspiring? Uh, I think one of the one of the things that and, and especially gallery did and is still doing it's a virtual gallery and mm. uh, people can I'm 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 I know it is far away from going to the gallery and you know experience the artwork but it is much better than nothing so yeah this is this is what we have got and how we can deal with that and 
and also some we can make some other works maybe it's a better platform to show it online at this moment this and how enough. about your that that uh, how about your use of social media is that important to you instagram and those sorts of things do you think that that visual artists need to be using those platforms now 100 percent. yeah everything uh, actually everything happened to me it's happened organically 90 percent of my achievement and galleries contact me through my social media or they seen my work even before and uh, strangely com com some companies contacted me before i never thought they one day they contact me for example uh, hollywood contacted me and uh, or uh, facebook contacted me but for, for the Facebook one, it's cancelled because of the pandemic. Mm. And sometimes it's a good time to expand to spend your time on the proper so social media platform. Because now, for example, in uh, your your Instagram now, it's it's your online uh, portfolio, and people can see what what you are doing. And uh, by you can use some hashtags, and people, you know following these hashtags and see your work. Some people are better at it than others, aren't they? Did you get any help with um, social media or did you just have a good instinct for it? No, I just 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 did it myself and practice it, you know, see what uh, it's a if, if you make a work and be active to making works, people start seeing you anyway. And Bucky, you, how about you? Do, sorry to interrupt, David. Yes, Bucky, do you use um, do you use social media a lot? What's your What's your approach to it? And your because it can be a total time suck as well, can't it? Yes, I um, I'm very I'm very bad at social media, but it has been social. Like my first commission or was from someone who seen my work on Pinterest that happened to go around, but. Yeah, it is so important, especially now. Um, but for my brand, one of the staff I work with is in charge of social media because I just, when there's, I, I can't deal with it. But there are ways, there are apps and stuff like that that you can like um, put your posts on and it will post it automatically and things like that for if there's any of you that aren't into it. Um, but as long as you get posts up, there it's not like time sensitive like you post and then an opportunity comes as long as you have your work on a page that if someone does come across something and they search your name there's somewhere for them to um see your work um mm -hmm. because I remember after graduating even having the physical graduation show I was like this is it someone from Vogue is going to pick me up and see my work and it's I heard like z zero things I even went to new designers which was like the creme de la creme of graduate shows not not one thing came of that and I was like oh I really thought that was it so I just want to encourage you guys as long as your stuff is on online that that was where the opportunity will come like I didn't know that my stuff was like being rotated on Pinterest like on people's boards and stuff and the brand ended up getting in contact with me like months after graduating, asking to do a collaboration. So um, even though you haven't got the graduate show, as long as it's on social media, on Pinterest, on on your website, that's people just come across it like the stuff on the internet doesn't go away. It'll keep like rotating and things like that. So even if you don't post often, as long as you have something up, yeah. That's really good advice, I think. So. I've now got a couple of questions that have come to me from students um, that aren't able to join us on the call later on. So um, a couple, they're, some of the re they're really good questions. So I'm going to go uh, round to you in turn with these. So Lauren, I'm going to start with you. And everybody will be able to identify with this. Have you ever experienced the feelings of imposter syndrome and how have you dealt with it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could do a whole Zoom call just on uh, imposter syndrome because it is so real. Um, I think, yeah, it's 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 really hard to overcome. I think for me, um, 
So I, so when I graduated and I was doing lots of freelance work and that's how I was kind of paying my bills. And I, and then I would, I had sort of built up a, a quite a successful career working as a working freelance in production. And I was working on BBC dramas and on Sky dramas and producing like really high end music videos. But it was never really what I imagined my life as a filmmaker to be. I wanted to be creating the work. I wanted to have a you know a creative stake in what was happening and I wanted it to mean something. If I was going to pour so much time and energy into something, I, I wanted it to be mine at the end of it. Mm. Um, so when the, uh, the first new round of film funding came back after the big hiatus of the UK Film Council disappearing, um, it was Creative England that were managing a fund. And I was like, Do you know what? I'm just, I'm going to like just give myself a year. And um, you know how it's always the like really like crazy delusional people. And you see them on interviews, like big celebrities. And they're like, I always knew that I was going to be yeah. like destined for something. And I was like, I'm just going to like allow myself to believe that could be me. I'm just going to like give myself a year to just be more delusional and just believe, believe that maybe it could happen um that's like six years ago now and I never went back to free I love work. more delusion <laughs> it's a bit like don't have a plan b I mean it's all yeah. different way of saying that you have to believe in yourself don't you You have to put everything on the line you yeah and and I think giving myself like a time frame helped because I was just like just for this year I'm just going to pretend when I walk in the room I'm just going to pretend and if, if people say what do you do I'm just going to say I'm a film producer even though I you know I'm not quite yeah. there yet I'm just going to I'm just going to own it and say what I want to be and and act like that is me but actually when you do that people just go oh, okay and they just they take that at face value and, and I think that helps give you confidence but yeah I mean like it is it is frightening every day it's like it's fine. I walk into like big meetings and uh, I feel really nervous. And I think yeah. you just got to ho hold your nerve, basically. Bucky, how about you? Has imposter De syndrome been an issue for you? Definitely. I mean, not much as an issue as I enjoy it. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just didn't, where I am, I didn't expect it from graduation. Like the, the journey I'm on is so different to what. I planned for when I graduated that I'm just like at this point I'm just like well I'm used to it if something comes along that I feel like I can do but not necessarily like in my I think it's the same like yeah I, I can do it like um just I blindly pessimistic well not blind okay not blindly pessimistic but like I can do this even yeah. if it's something I haven't done before in like exactly but I feel like I have the skills to I'll just be like okay YouTube Google um anything I don't know and just try and do my best um friend of mine who is a, a creative director at Saatchi says that there's absolutely nothing that you can't learn from a YouTube tutorial <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's always worth remembering yeah so on like imposter syndrome I especially in this field a lot of us are self-taught like we're putting ourselves out there and mm. um the experience we get is from our experience like how we've developed our practice so it sometimes you feel impossible like I can't believe people think I'm good enough to be here but normally if they've asked you it's like they they don't know how to do it either that's why they're asking someone else so you have kind of it's in your court how you Cool. Yeah, and you have yeah. to make sure that you've got the goods to back it up. Yeah. Um, Omid, coming to you, I mean, your career trajectory has been pretty swift. So there must have been points that you were just kind of like, you know, finding yourself at Venice Biennale kind of the, straight after you graduated pretty much. Ha, ha, have you felt the burn of imposter syndrome or have you, and, and how have you dealt with it if you have? No, the thing is uh, what I... What I learned during when I start art, this is I start art very late. I when I was 33, 34, and and I start from level one at college. And uh, when I started, I haven't got any any idea about the future, what is gonna be happen. Because when I started, I start feeling enjoying that things and uh, i i didn't think about anything else because i enjoy this journey 
I didn't I didn't think about what I'm going to be. I just liked this way I'm going. And uh, yeah, I start that and when I when when, when I finished my BA and I felt I don't want to be finished. I want to be a student my whole life. And uh, sometimes this kind of a studentship is happened by through your uh, university. And sometimes you have to do it by yourself. I I will be always a student and uh, I don't think very, you know, big image of myself in future. I just enjoy what I am today and uh, what I'm making. This is about the process and mm -hmm. I enjoy the process, not what I achieve or I, I, I'm, I'm not saying I don't enjoy the things I achieve, but when you concentrate on, on the achievements, you will stop or you will mm, lose, lose the way. Mm -hmm. But if you just find a way to just making a work, a study, thinking, and uh, be self-critical about your work and then suddenly the people the the opportunity you know will find you and achievement happen as well I can i just say can i just say them really quickly on that because i think it's yeah. like really interesting i was um watching a documentary on netflix uh, it was last year actually it's called the defiant ones it's about um jimmy iveen and dr dre and like uh, music producers but jimmy iveen was saying that you know race horses have blinkers on because what they to stop them looking from from the side because the second they look to the side you know they have an accident and fall over and he's saying yeah. creatives should be like race horses with blinkers on because the second you look to see what somebody else is doing or you start measuring yourself against other people's success or you start taking all that into account that's when you kind of Come a cropper basically i think it's really yeah really i think point. i think that's a life lesson for everyone isn't it there's lots of different ways of expressing that idea of comparison is the thief of joy and all that kind of thing like as soon as you start comparing yourself to other people it can be really crippling um i should say that that actually was from maria fernandez de Oso, who has graduated in the ma in graphic design and art direction um another question specifically for Omid from Fiona Sinead Brahoni, who has graduated on the MA in photography. This is a really interesting one. What transferable skills taken from boxing do you use within your artistic practice? So she suggested discipline, training, improvisation, intuition. Do you reflect on correlations between boxing, engineering and art practice? I'm not sure about engineering, but boxing, I learned a lot of things, not just for my arts, for my living as well. And uh, the world for me, it's like a boxing ring and uh, you you shouldn't be surrounded. And if you get hit, you have to stand up again. And uh, this is the way I learned. And uh, maybe, yeah, I, I received a, a, an an email from one of my friends who knows me from my childhood. And he said, are you really Omid? And I say, yes. I say, you were a boxer. And uh, I said, well, yeah, what's the difference? And because, <laughs> because what you've done before is, uh, this is the kind of lifestyle you, you, you choose. And sometimes you, have, you haven't got to choose, you have to do it. But, the discipline you learn from boxing and also hardship because you what happened in the boxing you 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 face the punches mm -hmm. and you have to sometimes the pain the the exhausted when, when you get exhausted what 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 gonna be happen if you get exhausted if you have if no your the punch come to your face and you be uh, shocked or be a stunt. What gonna be happen to you? What, 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 what is your plan? This is this is happened through the life as well, and I liked it, and I still use my my boxing discipline, my boxing strategy to art world as well. Thank you. That was a really good question from Fiona. Yeah. She's got another one for you as well, Lauren, uh, which is what advice 
advice can you give to directors looking to collaborate with producers? What is your absolute do not ask, do not approach me in this way? And how would you as a producer like to be approached? This is like an age old question. It's like it's always a question that writers and directors ask because, you know, producers are are the people who are um, making the work happen. They're the people who spot a good idea and turn it into a fantastic film and have the connections with the finance and, and the skills to kind of make it happen. So right, new writers and directors are always wanting to know how to how to meet producers. Um, my advice would be, firstly, watch loads of short films uh you know go to the festivals they're all happening they're, they're still happening none of them have been cancelled at the moment they're online watch films see what films you like and find out who the producer is every producer has a as a kind of like a taste and a, and a tone of work they're looking for so if you like the work that you're seeing um the chances are that you'll be on a similar wavelength so i would that's a really good way to find producers and and everybody is available to find online these days everyone has a social media presence um, I think also you can speak directly to talent executives at uh, BFI Film Hub North. Their whole job is to track talent. They have, you know, names and email addresses for producers, writer directors, and they will be able to match you up with somebody who's at the right level to you. I ideally, you know, this is something else I think new writers and directors look at really established producers and think that that's who I want to get with because they're really you know like high up and they've done loads of stuff and they've got loads of prestige and they'll be able they'll have loads of money um I remember a really experienced producer saying to me once you know no producer has more money in this pocket than any other producer just because they're somebody's experience everyone's still going to the same funding and I think ideally you want to find somebody who is at a similar level to you that you can grow with together and build a relationship with together and actually new producers are going to give you so much more time and energy that it's so much harder for a more established producer to give you because they'll be really busy um so I think those are the places to look in terms of like how to uh, how to approach somebody um I think again it's just it's being friendly I, I get lots of emails from writers directors and they're really long emails and if I'm busy I, I struggle to read them or I'll, I'll mark them unread and then they fall to the bottom of my inbox and it yeah. takes me months to get back to them and just give me like a quick brief heads up of what kind of work you're doing send me some links so I can see and just say like hey like this is what I'm doing it'd be great to chat to you again people think this thing about networking is is really like officious and kind of professional and you've got to be like really stern it's just not true you know like it's about making friends and yeah. again like when we get back to normality whatever that will look like go to the film festivals go up to the filmmakers go up to the producers that you like and have a chat with them just make friends with them that's that's the best thing I think when you come in really strong and you're like I am looking for this producer to do this for me and like this is what I need and this is what I need it done by like you it's, it's not about that it's just about trying to create some kind of genuine connection um I think that's all really good advice thank you so much so thank you so much to the three of you I think there's been some really important themes that have come out of this obviously we've had a really diverse panel on this discussion but I love to be more delusional don't have a plan b <laughs> you know get your portfolio online really trust your process um you've got to be tenacious and I building networks being not a formal thing so much as it is about building relationships and about you know making friends with people and 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 getting out there and 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 um doing what you can to make those connections so thank you so much to our panelists to lauren dunn bucky baldwin and omar dasadi we're gonna come back with some questions from students in a moment so we're going to be inviting some students onto the call to have a chat directly and we will see you very shortly thank you thank you thank you thanks welcome back and we've now got some students joining us on this call and uh, they're going to be asking some questions to our panelists so we'd like to welcome sara Mackay who has graduated with an MA in graphic design and art direction. Pedro Duarte, who's graduated with his MA in fashion art direction. And Tim McConville, who's graduated in MA photography. And so we're going to start off with you, Sarah. Have you got a question for our panellists? 
Yes, I have a question for uh, Omid first. And I wanted to ask you, because you talked a lot about uh, feeling um, creative and inspired throughout this lockdown. So I wanted to ask you, what would be your advice to uh, creatives who are feeling discouraged and uninspired uh, and are finding it a bit hard to stay creative at all? Uh, one thing I can, uh, because you, at, at at first you have to find out why you are in this courage you have to find the roots of this problem so if it's if it comes from uh what what situation hold you in in and keep keep you that feeling one thing i can advise you is if you start reading reading anything you like and what, for example, if, if you, for example, if you like philosophy, read philosophy. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily be cre cre creative at the moment. You have to, because be, being creative, you have to have a good amount of things in your mind. Your, your, your mind is, looks like a factory. You have to give them feed and then it's processed this feed and give you a feedback you know it's a kind of if if you haven't got if if you don't put anything enough inside it can't produce anything for you you know creativity happened but itself you have to prepare it for for the for creativity one thing is reading one thing is thinking and another thing is seeing things and all these helps you to be more creative make your question for you for yourself a lot you know think about anything you see mindfully you know just just don't pass anything try to focus on everything around you just simple things and try see everything differently try it and for example the washing the dishes try try see it differently you know focus on why why i'm doing this is any, any any other way i can do it or think about why you know put the why before everything and then and a lot of things happen in your in your mind and also yeah feed it and you have to read a lot and not not just about the art about anything you like and anything or over this discover new things as well uh don't stick and what I have, what you have done, you know, try other things, try other direction. For example, if, if you practice painting, now see what, what short film looks like, like video, like performance, you know, see other artists' works. This is kind of feed you and, and push you to make things, I think. Is that clear? Yeah, <laughs> it is. Thank you. Welcome. That was a really good question, Sarah, and thanks for that answer. That was really, um, really inspiring, actually. Has anyone else got anything to add? Um, yeah, I'll, one of the things um, I do is uh, watching videos of people like there's now like on Netflix or on everywhere, there's those documentaries of people in their field like one artist or collective and I always find those so inspiring or someone who's just excelling in their area I, it might not be good if you find yourself if you find yourself to be jealous or that makes you upset to see people but if you like seeing other people work that always makes me want to go and create when I see someone who's really in their field enjoying what they're doing and and being successful so that's ways so that gets me really like pumped, like okay I have to do something that's a really great series, actually. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's brilliant. Um, is it Art, Art of Design? Something, Something like that. that. Yeah. Um, we'll find it and we'll put um, we'll put it in the chat so that people can find it. And one thing else I can add, uh, never compare yourself with anyone else, you know. This is maybe put you down. And this, you never, uh, in, in first, in when we start MA, again, Ian told us, something very good he said never compare yourself with other artists around yourself if you want to compare yourself compare yourself with Caravaggio do not 
don't compare yourself with other students. You know, T thinking big. You know, don't compare. Uh, oh, did got this? Ex for example, exhibition. I haven't done anything yet. You know, maybe it's not the time right now. And next year, maybe you are here and that guy is here. You know, you don't know what's going on. Don't compare yourself with anyone else. Just try to concentrate on your work. Can I say something very quickly as well in addition to that, just to say that, like, I think one of the things we do all the time as artists put lots of pressure on ourselves to try and generate something that's really, really good and, and really, really meaningful. And I think sometimes just letting some of that pressure off yourself and allowing yourself to have fun and explore things and let the process kind of take the lead yeah. is like absolutely the way to kind of bring back some of that creativity. And certainly in the film industry, there's a guy who's getting a lot of heat at the moment. His name's Rob Savage, he's a director, and he made a, a horror film on Zoom during the first lockdown called Host. And he made it on his sofa with his friends who were all on Zoom and they crafted this incredible story just for a bit of fun. And he's actually picked up a huge deal with Bloomhouse, which is the, which is a, a huge Hollywood producer who's known for like making films like Get Out and Whiplash and off the back of this thing that he did for fun during lockdowns. So I think, yeah, just allowing yourself to be free and, and not putting too much pressure on yourself is really important right now. That film, and, but don't watch that film because it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for that answer. Thank you, Sara. So, Pedro, have you got a question for our panelists? I do, yes. I have a question for Lauren. Uh, you did mention and you talked a little bit about exploitation. And as a recent graduate, how, how to deal with, with these issues because it happens and uh, what would be the best advice to deal with uh, this kind of situation? Yeah, this is a really good question. It's something that I get asked a lot by the BA students as well. Um, and I think the question that I often get asked is, when should you work for free? Um, and how do you know what is exploitative and what is a genuine opportun opportunity? And I think um, the thing is to be really smart and astute about where this opportunity is coming from, who who is behind it. Is it other artists who want to collaborate and do something together or is it a big company who you know do have the resources and the finances to employ you properly um so i think it's about it's about doing your due diligence and your homework on on kind of where where the opportunities are coming from and i think also understanding is there something for you in it you know we see a lot in the film industry for example people will be given opportunities to come and get some work experience on set or you know do some running um and then they go and do those things and they you know they're driving around the whole time or they're just making cups of tea and they never get they never get a chance to learn anything so i think just make sure that there is something in it for you um and that, that it's a genuine learning experience for you and i think that's when i'd say that if it's if it's unpaid, it's worth it. If it's if it's a genuine collaboration with other artists and you're having a big creative stake in what's happening, or it's a genuine learning and training opportunity, um, and if it's if it's some if it's coming from somewhere else that you know it's it's being masked as a competition by somebody who should have the finance to pay you, that's when it's exploitation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Has anyone got anything else to add to that? about work it's more about working for free isn't it and knowing your own value yes it's really hard to know how much to charge as well and what what your fees mm. are um i don't know if you guys want to chip in on on that because i think that's a really tough one to navigate when you first start as well yeah yeah, right. oh, uh, yeah go on after you <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is it is still a challenge because it's it's like you want to find the sweet spot between how much they think you're worth and how much you think they're worth because if I charge too much they'll be like oh I can't afford you mm. or you don't want to scare them away but what I found is um if you charge too high or I, I've never had a given a someone who's actually in the position to commission an artist or something who have been like that's too expensive we're going elsewhere um Either they, the, the only time that's been cancelled is if they lose funding for the entire project. So that it's not like they go elsewhere. So um, if they're at the point where they're asking to commission you, like they've reached out to you to do something for them, you're well in your position to do a normal artist fee, uh, which is, 
I don't know. I would say for um, a normal artist, like a mural or something, charging for the job um, is often a good way if you don't know how long it's going to take you. Um, and just asking around how much people are charging. But Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. I think speaking to people, speaking to your peers and getting people to, because there's such a big stigma around talking about money. And actually, it's mm -hmm. really important that people do share information about how they're valuing their work so that um, so that emerging graduates can get a sense, because it's difficult. It is really difficult to know how to do it at first. Omid, have you got any advice on how you initially approach pricing yeah, and selling your work? Yeah, uh, as others say, it's not an easy, easy one to to recognize, is it? But it depends on your portfolio and your CV uh, also as as well. If you if it helps you to connect you with other or, or other organization or other opportunities maybe is better to do it than not doing because it's is it's a free free project if yeah if it if, if it connect you with the or push you forward do it but if you there is, there is no point from from you from your creativity and from not not just from fun part of uh, funding from other part if you give you any bet, bet, better better experience or if not getting you any anything else just don't do it but if it gives you something yeah do mm -hmm. it is 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 bet, bet, better doing it when when you graduate you have to build up something when i when i, when I uh, start selling my work especially my leaf uh, leaf work uh, 10 years ago so most of the time i start from 10 pound per each each work and, and and i spend near two weeks to make that work you know wow that, yeah wow hmm. can i just before we wrap up on this question i was just hmm. thinking there's um there's a magazine called intern uh, and they have a really great social media presence as well the guy who runs that alec has literally just put up a course during the kind of the, the pandemic about how to price your work as an artist it's called the price is right so you can there's loads of links for it on their on their instagram page um so it's might be worth checking that out they're, they're really brilliant what they do and, and i know alex done a really great job putting the course together and i think there's loads of really brilliant advice in there so it might be worth looking at and and also one thing else yeah it's it's your it, it's about your value if you people mm -hmm. understand graduate students they they can dis disadvantage from them and they mm. for free then they start this is kind of be a business you know mm. and you have to know your value and mm. your time is not free and sure. uh, because now people especially in art industry are you know frustrated are mm -hmm. you know doing many things for free then they it, it is not good actually we, we have to start we have to start not doing things for free you know this is our time this is our value this is this is our you know precious things we we put we have to get something to paying bills to paying rents you know that kind of thing is not coming from the sky we have to we have to pay from these things that was really good. Thank you. And thank you for that question, Pedro. So I've got a question from Tim McConville, who can't join us on the call, but who sent me a question in the chat, which is for Omid. So he says, I'm a photographer working on commissions. I find having a solid working method, a process that I trust in, is important so that when, thing, think, when things get tough, you can forge ahead by believing in your process. I wondered if that's the case for you and what specifically do you regard as an important aspect of your process that you rely on? It's, it was a little bit long when you repeated the, the last part. <laughs> he says, what specifically is an important aspect of your artistic process that you rely on when things get difficult? Yeah, uh, one thing I think uh, is very important, I, I think I'd say through my uh, what I said before, you have you have no choice. You have to be flexible. And if something getting wrong, you have to or get getting difficult. You have to accept it and do something about that. I don't know in, in photography it's 
a little bit different because photography is photography. Uh, you can do photography and change it to the painting. is is not is not is not working that way. But I'm sure in your field you can find something else. It it, it has happened to me during last 10, 10 months. I face a lot of problems. For example, financially, creativity, everything, everything. Most of my project closed, postponed, or cancelled. So, what I can do? As I said, I start, I, I start reading. In, in, I have no, just one month. I, I, I have two show, and one of them is happening. Two weeks be, before my show, I access to, to, to my studios, to, 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 to my studio. I haven't got access to anything. And I had to be flexible and, uh, you know, you find a way. Sometimes it's not just making the work. As I said to Sarah, sometimes we need to put feet or mind, you know, if, if, the, if we have a problem. If we have a problem to make the things, if we have a problem to contact with the galleries, if we have a problem to anything, something, sometimes everything has stopped for you in, in all the ways. So, and everything became so scary, so insecure. So what you, what you can do, you can read, you can fo focus on your website or you can maintain your social media. Do you know? A small things, focus on a small things, maybe it helps you. I don't know if it helps or not, but this is the thing I, I this, this is my experience from during this, these days. Thank you, Omid. Um, so, Sarah, have you got another question? Yes, um, I want to ask Baki. So you all talked about creating a sustainable business. Um, uh, what would you say um, it's a good advice for graduates who want to create a sustainable freelance career or business for themselves? Because obviously you're doing that with your own business. Yes. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of research. It's a, it, depending on what you're kind of making. It's only actually thanks to the pandemic <laughs> again and having to close. I've had a really substantial amount of time to research materials and really try and make my clothes as sustainable as possible. So when I had my first collection, the sustainable aspect was a uh, made to order. So I didn't stock or have a massive amount of items somewhere. I made one of each item and if someone uh, wanted something, we made for them. And then it was this time having several months to find manufacturers and things like that, that I was like, able to make actually things like materials and things like that. Starting out, the hard thing is um, it, when you want to make a product line is the minimum order quantities of manufacturers. Because normally the only time it becomes affordable is if you buy thousands of meters or thousands of something especially with sustainable lines. So you have to make try and make some sort of relationship with manufacturers and pitch yourself to people you're going to be buying from, which sounds weird, but you're literally like, you have to be like, I'm a small business or I'm a designer. And even though I'm not ordering a thousand rooms, can you give me a discount? To, so it takes a lot of, you, you have to just call so many people and things like that, but the, you will find manufacturers people you can partner with in the process that will help you build your sustainable kind of product um, luckily in manchester there's a lot of um, fabric manufacturers so not just buying the fabric reams that they've imported from china but they actually produce it here so it you can get on the phone to people and in, in manchester and uh, like find someone that will um maybe give you a kind of deal as a starting out kind of business um yeah i'll say thanks <laughs> okay um sorry does that answer your question yes thank you yeah, sorry. <laughs> um pedro have you got another one for us and then i think that's going to be our last one 
Yes, I have a question for Omid. Uh, you did mention uh, living the present and working and being flexible to the things that are happening right now. How do you, how does your work comment on the current current social and pandemic issues at the at the moment? Mm, as I said, yeah, the, uh, this pandemic not not just affect my my work is affect everything so uh but uh i think i th i said it before you have to be flexible and uh, learn new things practice new things i i practice i practice something i never done before for example i start new kind of painting i never done and uh, again my i I practice new skills, you know, you, you have something that this is a good time because everything is closed and this is a good time to gain new things. For example, if you, if you, your drawing is not good, start, start drawing. If, if you have got a problem to take a photo of your artwork, find out how you can get a bit better quality of a uh, uh, photo from your, your artwork. Or how can I how how can you send this artwork to some uh, to some exhibition or some galleries or some uh, you know this is a, a lot of things you can do and uh, because as I said being an artist just making a work is uh, like a fifty percent of your thing you do you know mm -hmm. other fifty percent is comes from your reading your research your uh, you know a small mm -hmm. things you do even maintain your website you know social media or connect with other artists or you know in even in in your course or their friends or you know mm -hmm. con contact as many people creative people as you can you know this is a kind of build up your network you know Oppor most of your uh, most of you, most of your opportunities comes from your net network you build up before and this is a best way to connect the people and now because many people stay at home they have more free time to spend with you even the galleries even the, the friends if they have been busy before do you know mm -hmm. use this this time to connect people Thank you. That's a really good positive point. Um, have, have either of you got anything else to add to that? The time. I, yeah, I think there's something definitely just to follow on that on that point about people having more time now. I think it's it's never been a better time to reach out to people, and also the kind of just the normalisation of remote working, and it's like totally cool to jump on a Zoom. Um, I've really benefited from that and I've had some meetings with some really big financiers and studios and stuff that I would have struggled to get a meeting with. So I think taking advantage of the way in which we're working now is is uh, is great. And, you know, you, you're not limited by where you are anymore. You can speak to anyone, have a, a virtual meeting anywhere in the world, and that's totally normal and accepted. Mm. Thank you. And we're going to leave uh, it there. So that's sorry, how one thing I can add, yeah. Uh, this is a good for for you. You have a, a deadline. Make a deadline for yourself. You know, mm. first of all, make a plan. Then make a deadline for for your plan. This is a like you you are still in in the university. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have got any 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 deadline, you think your your mind think you have a lot of time. Do it tomorrow or no, next week. You know, but if you Make a, make a deadline for yourself until next two months. I have to finish this, for example, reading or finish these skills or or and and or any plan you have got. The mm -hmm. the deadline and have a plan is very important for you. And yeah, maybe I start with reading. I, I encourage you to read. You know, for everyone, because it was very necessary for my for myself. And uh, I achieved a lot of my ideas from my reading. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. So thank you so much to our graduates, Sarah, Pedro and Tim, for joining us and asking such thoughtful questions. 
And a huge thank you to our panellists, Lauren, Bucky and Omid. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you and I hope it's been useful for all our new graduates. So just to say as well, as I said earlier on, the MA show is online at the moment and fingers crossed the physical show is going to be uh, on display in 2021. So thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing everybody in real life soon. Take okay. care. Bye. Thank you very much, Thank you. everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.